Um, everybody's got a seat. There's water and some snacks in back. We're going to be here for a little bit and uh, appreciate everybody coming. Um, we're booked for an hour and a half, but we'll, my guess is we'll probably go over a little bit. Um, and it's a slightly different format this year. So um, for anybody who knows me, I'm Kevin O'Brien. Uh, and I was a squirt director last year. This year I took the position of ADM director. Um, and uh, I know we all hear ADM a lot. Uh, what, uh, what I want to be clear on is, you know, this is not the ADM. Um, this is the ADM, you know. Our collective knowledge and our collective hours and our collective training, um, my hope uh, at the end of the season is that we stop saying American development model and we start saying our development model. Um, I've got a chance to skate with so many of you guys and coach with so many of you guys and the commitment, uh, the knowledge and the skills uh, that we're passing on to our kids is pretty awesome. Um, we've all been blessed to have time with, with Roger Grillo. Uh, to kind of go over concepts. We've all done our CEP work. Uh, we've all done our online module work. Um, Earl will cover a, a bunch of stuff uh, later in the meeting. Um, what, what we really wanted to cover this year was uh, the fact that uh, we're going to be running the program uh, this year as a probationary year as a model association. And a model association is not a moniker, it's not a designation, uh, it's a commitment and uh, it's execution of the principles of the American development model. Um, Earl's really pushed for us to continue to adopt and adapt our program to the model and what, uh, what we do, believe it or not, is a model association. We execute a model association. We're missing a couple things. You know, we all know we're missing a couple things. Um, but uh, our partnership with Holy Cross and, and uh, Coach Berard's uh, commitment to help us um, and Holy Cross's commitment to help us is, is really going to uh, bring us the additional resources we need to fill in any gaps. Um, you know, as far as qualified coaching goes, when, when you read through, uh, if you haven't read through the, this kind of checklist in the application, um, requires us uh, to have qualified coaching in the areas of skating, puck skills, and goaltending. Uh, we've always had our goaltending clinics and goaltending coach, um, but skating and puck skills, you know, we all do it. We all might do it a little bit differently. But this year, I think we'll just try to work towards gaining some common vocabulary around it and, and common teaching of uh, the fundamentals. Uh, we also brought in um, Brad Gilmartin. He's an assistant coach at WPI. He's going to run our Learn to Skate and Learn to Play program this year. Um, you know, we all love Chris, and she all did a, an incredible job for us uh, over the past few years. Uh, but it's a real opportunity to get Brad in and start the kids with great fundamentals. Um, and then off-ice training, um, the three words that we all fear a little bit. Um, I think just because uh, we hear it and, and we don't really know how to execute it. Um, this year we're really blessed. Uh, Jeff Oliver, who's in the back of the room, Jeff, if you could just uh, put your hand up so people can put a face with a name. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is a head strength and conditioning coach here at Holy Cross. Uh, and he's agreed to work with myself and Wayne Penniman um, to put together some uh, simple fundamentals for us to follow. Uh, you also hear later tonight from Mike Cavino, uh, who runs Peak Fitness. Um, and if you're not aware of it yet, uh, Peak Fitness is going to have a 9,000 square foot off ice training center in the new Worcester rinks. Um, and he'll talk tonight about his special offer to the program. 
which is pretty amazing and a pretty unique opportunity for us to get together as teams and do some off-ice conditioning together. Um, but uh, before all of that, um, we have two incredible speakers aforementioned, Roger Grillo, who's the uh, Northeast uh, Director for the American Development Model of USA Hockey, and Coach Berard, the head coach of men's ice hockey. Um, coach uh, Berard will talk uh, a little bit about um, what we do, the small area games and the station-based practices. Um, you know, we, we all need to dispel that thought that um, that part of the model is, is for six and, and eight-year-olds. You know, it, it really is skill development is a lifelong process. I know we all know that because I watch some of you skate too. Um, so we can all always pick up skills late into life. Um, and then Roger will talk a little bit about uh, off-ice conditioning and, and what the day-to-day -day of a model association looks like. So I'll turn the mic over to Coach Berard, and uh, thank you, Coach. Thanks, guys. How you doing? Good. Good. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. I was uh, I was really happy to be asked by Kevin to come and speak to you guys about you know just some thoughts that we have and and talk a little bit about the relationship that we're going to forge with the organization. So. This summer, we kind of um, formalized the relationship between your organization and Holy Cross. And part of that um, relationship is that my coaching staff, myself and my three assistants, we're going to have three or four coaching clinics throughout the course of the year. I think our first one's going to be sometime in September, a date to be announced. And then we'll continue that throughout the course of the year. And a big part of this relationship, as Kevin spoke about, is trying to create a common theme throughout the coaching fraternity, all the coaches in the organization. So if you're coaching a Mite team or a Squirt team or a Bantam team or a Pee Wee team, we're all speaking the same language. And not that, you know, different people might have a different way of doing it. If the, if the vocabulary is the same, then it's consistency. And I think that's the biggest thing is having consistency in your teaching, having consistency in your thought and in your philosophy, and I think that's one of the big things with the, uh, with the ADM. Before we talk a little bit more, I, I think it's important to note, I'm, I'm a youth hockey parent myself. I have a 14-year-old and I have a 13-year-old, and I was sitting in your shoes um, for the last number of years, the last eight to 10 years, and one of the things that um, happened at the beginning of my kids experience in hockey was this whole ADM movement and at first it was a little bit scary and it was a little bit different and people balked at it because it's like why are we going to use blue pucks I watched the NHL they use black pucks why am I why is my kid at six years old using a blue puck why aren't you practicing full ice I just saw a high school team on the ice practice before my kids might team, why are they going full ice and my kid only gets one zone? There's, and, and all these, and then it was about the number of games, like 65, 70 games, and the model is one game per three practices. So it was a big, I guess a lot of people were upset by the notion of changing maybe what we did when we were growing up or, or changing what had become of youth hockey. And over the last 10 years, I've seen a big shift in that thinking and in, in the way that people view the ADM. Just a couple of things I wanna, I wanna talk to you about. So Roger and I were here before and we were just talking with Kevin. And so we play 34 regular season games at Holy Cross. So counting it up roughly, we probably practice 110 times during the year. That doesn't include individual skill sessions. That doesn't include all the ice that we have in September prior to the season. That's 110 practices from the time we start in October till our last game. Combined with that, we're also working out with Coach Oliver probably roughly 60 times from September to the end of the season. That doesn't include the workouts that they do in the summer that doesn't include our postseason workouts before they go home. 
So if you look at that at the college level, which is a pretty high level, it's not the NHL, but it's just below it. You're talking about 34 games, 110 practices, 60 workouts at the minimum. So what I, what I think about is if I'm a youth hockey coach or I'm giving my advice to youth hockey, we should try to mirror that as much as we can. So that three to one ratio, that's what we're doing at the college level. If you then take a might team and they play 70 games and they practice 50 times, then that's probably not a really good ratio for development. And we had a player, TJ Moore, who went to the Bruins development camp this summer. And I went up there to watch him skate. And the majority of their skates that they had as a group, it was like an hour and a half skate, the majority of that time was spent on development. Power skating, passing, stick handling, drills. And then the last two days of the camp were all, it was four on four and three on three. All small game stuff. So when we look at the ADM, when we look at some of the pitfalls and some of the, some of the uh, things that people say and why they don't like it, a lot of times it's about those things. And when you look at an NHL development camp and you look at what we're doing on a daily basis in our practices, those are the types of things that we're doing. So what I would like to impress upon you is, is to think about that as you plan your practice sessions. You know, I watch sometimes we, I'll be leaving the office late at night and I'll watch, maybe it's not your organization, maybe it's the, the Sharks or other organizations that are in here. And, um, you know, there'll be, there'll be 10 eight-year-olds on the ice and they'll be doing full ice drills and there's eight kids that are looking up at the lights and shooting pucks and there's two kids that are going in the drill. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that might not be the most effective use of your time or use of your ice sheet. And then I see other times on a Saturday morning, I'll come in and I'll see your organization out there and you'll have five or six stations going. Kids are constantly moving. That's how guys, that's how the kids are going to get better. By, by frequency, by doing things, by figuring it out themselves, by being creative, not overcoaching it, giving them some instruction and letting them figure it out. Those are the type of things that are going to make them better. What I find at our level is sometimes we got to take a step back and we got to do more of that stuff because they haven't been necessarily trained the right way going through their youth hockey experience. So I would impress upon you the importance of skill development and, you know, that's skating, that's passing, that's receiving, that's shooting, but that's also playing small games and letting them be creative. You know, sometimes when my kids were growing up, you know, they play mites and squirts, and it was like the, the game of the dominant player, right? So you had a really good player that could skate and maybe was a little bit advanced on some of the kids from that perspective or a puck handling perspective. That guy gets the puck, he goes all the way down the ice and scores. Well, then you have Johnny Smith that's either playing with him or on the other team that doesn't even touch the puck or maybe it's on his stick for about one second for the game. How does that player get better? How do his skills improve? It's certainly not going to be from playing in a full ice game at eight years old. What it's going to be is being in a practice that has stations that he gets as much time working on that skill as the best player does. And in a small area, he might touch the puck and have the puck more than he would in a full ice game. That's how he develops confidence. That's how his skills develop. And that's what the ADM is all about, in my opinion. We incorporate skill development into our practices. So we always have a segment of practice that we devote to skill development. And it could, you know, it's usually with the whole team. But we will also have skill development sessions for our players during the course of the week. So at least two times a week, our guys are coming up to work on their game individually. It might be in groups of two or groups of three or groups of four. But they're getting supplemental work on their game besides what we're doing as a team in practice. Besides what they're doing with Ollie in the weight room. And obviously you guys don't have that ability to do that. You have a finite number of practices. Your practices are a certain length. You don't get your kids able to walk up the hill 10, 10 minutes and, and get come put on their equipment. But I think it's important when you do have a session 
that it's well thought out, that you're thinking about repetition, repetition of skills, frequency of skills, and also have the approach. It's not so much about winning and losing as a team. It's more about individually developing your players because I guarantee you at the end of the year, if you've done a good job developing your players individually, you're going to win your share of games. It's not about winning in September or October. It's about winning in March. What's the best way to impact winning? Making your players better. So it's the same approach we take at this level. We, think we get this group of guys at a certain level when they get here in September. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to develop each guy with the use of Ollie, with the use of the, our sports psychologists, with what we do in practice, with skill development, with video sessions, to make each guy incrementally better. So at the end of the year, we have a better team if we have 27 individuals that have become better over the course of time. And that would be, that's our philosophy, and that would be the philosophy that I would share with you that I think is, would be very beneficial to your coaching and your team's success in the long run. And I think if your players feel like the coaches are in it for them and that they feel you have their best interests at heart and you're willing to work with them and the pressure to win isn't so much that it makes them fear failure, that you're going to see some breakthroughs in some of your players. You're going to see your weaker players get stronger and you're going to see your better players uh, advance and at the end of the day you want them to come back you want them to work hard they got to have fun and playing small games and touching the puck especially if you're not a player that is strong as strong as others that's where they're going to have fun you got to give them motivation to come back so your enthusiasm your preparation the way you design your practices the more fun it is the more they're willing to go out and do it so I said my two kids you know, in the summer they play baseball and they play two sports. But um, this summer, my oldest son's coach, he runs a skill development clinics in the summer. And we've never really done that. We've kind of, when hockey season ended, we went right to baseball and played baseball with the odd tournament here or there. But every Monday and Wednesday they go to this, to this coach's clinic. And it's in Foxborough, so they got to drive 40 minutes from home to do it. And they absolutely love it because they think they're getting better. It's not playing games, it's not playing in a tournament, it's not playing in a showcase. It's actually getting on the ice, being uncomfortable, working on the things they're not good at, and seeing improvement from week to week to week. And they have, they have gotten better and better over the course of the last two months because they've made that decision to do that. And you can have that impact on your players as well because you have them a little bit longer. And games are important, and we love games, you know, Hockey, you know, you win and lose, and there's, there's some valuable lessons that you learn from competing. But if you want to have a better team, I would say instead of investing more money into going to playing games and showcases and traveling all over the Northeast, invest time and effort into planning good practices and working with your players to get better individually. And if you do that, you're going to have happier kids, happier parents, more rewarding experiences and kids that want to play next year when it's time to register and sign up again. So, you know, I'm looking forward to working with you guys. I'm looking forward to working with the organization. And we'll, we'll talk with Kevin on the specific things that we're going to talk about in the clinics. And I would encourage you, if you have topics that you want us to discuss that are more applicable to you guys, let Kevin know, he'll get them to me, and then when we have our sessions, we'll be able to talk about those items and then obviously throw things in that we feel are, are appropriate as well. But Roger and I have known each other a long time, and, and I'm a big believer in the ADM because we use a lot of it ourselves, and I'm a big believer in what USA Hockey's doing. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to forging this relationship and making it a great one. Okay? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Coach. Um, and at this point, I'll turn it over to Roger to talk a little bit more about off-ice conditioning. So first of all, I just want to thank you all on behalf of USA Hockey and certainly on behalf of the organization here for taking a, a summer night as we wind down the, the, end of the, the end of the summer season, unfortunately, and head back into the fall. Um, and, and hopefully today or tonight here for a little bit, we can make this interactive and, and, as, and as much to benefit you and your individual teams 
uh, or yourself as an individual coach. I will say this, that uh, as David just mentioned, we've known each other for a long, long time, coached against each other for a long time, and um, you're really fortunate that you have a relationship with a quality university like Holy Cross and a quality coach like David Berard. Uh, and what he says he means, he, he, use it as a resource. Uh, use it as an opportunity. You got unbelievable facility here. You got a, a campus right here. You got a Division One college hockey program. Come up and watch a practice. Get your kids to come to the games. Let let your kids find a a, a role model within one of his players. Um, let them try to emulate somebody that they may be able to aspire to be. Uh, the NHL is a pretty tough level to get to. This is a really tough level to get to, but I can tell you it's a little bit easier than getting to the NHL. Uh, find a local high school. Player or, or somebody within your community. We call that vertical coaching. And so what you have, similar to what the European system has, is you have quality people, a strength coach, a Division I head coach, his other staff, his players, the community here at Holy Cross. It's an absolute no-brainer, and you're really, really fortunate. And I would tell you for your own, how many of you are coaching your own kids? Okay, that's why you're here. You're here because your, your, your son or your daughter is committed to becoming a hockey player. And I would just beg you, hockey dad, former hockey dad, do it right, do it well, because you don't get to hit reset. When my son looked at me when he was 15, his older son's age and said, Dad, I want to do what you did. And I said, what's that? He said, I, I want to play college hockey. I went, who? I went, man, I go, Dominic, I, you're a long ways away. I, I'll try to catch up. But I, I kind of wish I'd known that when you were 10, because I would have been way more involved and would have put you in a different environment than the one you grew up in. Because the one you grew up in was 1970s power skating for 30 minutes, five on oh breakouts, loop and shoot for 20 minutes, one or two practices a week, play your two games on the weekend, done. End of story. Meanwhile, while the weather in the winter changed and he had zero opportunity to skate on an outdoor pond or outdoor ice. How you do that at 15? Train's already left the station in a lot of cases. So you have one opportunity with your own child if they have the passion to play the game and do it right. Now the challenge is, is that when they're eight, they're gonna wanna go to the rink every day. But you know that that's not probably the right thing to do. You want that same kid at 15, 16 to say, Dad, I wanna go to the rink every day. I wanna train. Because when they get to 14, there's a fork in the road. And the responsibility for their development switches from you to them. You're just a vehicle to get them there. Okay? So don't push that button at 8, 9, when they do have the passion. Because what you don't want to have happen is when they're 15, 16, and it is time for them to kind of geek it up and get after it. Their eyes have rolled back in their head, and they throw their hands up and say, I don't want to do it. I'm burned out. I've been doing it for 7, 8 years. And so that's the difference. The difference is passion. What separates the good from the great, the guys that he coach that get better are the ones that when they go to the weight room with the coach, they step on the ice, they come to the individual skill sessions, they don't look for shortcuts. They go hard, they do it right, they do it well, because he can hold them accountable, but it's all the extra stuff. It's eating right, it's sleeping right, it's training right. That's what separates the good from the great. And so you got to be really careful about how we manage those little kids because they're not adults, they're little kids. So I just want to show you a few slides here just so that, um, just to kind of some refresher stuff here, okay? Just remember why this program's in place. This program's in place so that we, at the upper end, can become the greatest hockey nation in the, in the world, okay? We just finished fifth in the biggest international ice tournament ice hockey tournament for 17 year olds in the world okay and we don't get to send our best players we send like a b team last year we, we lost in the championship in in with four minutes left okay but we're battling countries that have fewer players than the state that we're in right now we're battling the czechs at 22,000 kids the swiss the slovaks okay the finns Number one playing ice hockey country in the world right now, the Finns, okay? The Swedes, unbelievable, okay? With fewer players than Massachusetts. 
at the youth level. So all we're saying is if we could just do it a little bit better. The difference over here in these countries, because I spend time over there with those guys, is what Coach Berard just said. It's the commitment to the individual athlete at a young age. We know that you feel pressure from mom and dad. We know that you feel pressure from yourself to win. We get that. But if you take the shortcut to win, the individual athlete hurts. Because when your child goes to take an SAT test, they don't take it as a classroom. So if your teacher focused on how the classroom um, performed, rather than each individual student in that classroom, your kid's screwed when they have to stand alone. If you're focused on the team and all the concepts and systems and play with the team, and you're not focused on the development of each individual athlete, you're coaching 12 kids, you're coaching 12 kids, not the unit of 12. And that's a whole different mindset. And I would say to you, because you're coaching your own kid, do it right, do it well for your kid. The rest of the kids will benefit. And I'll also tell you this, it's not easy to do it right and do it well. It's hard. If it was easy, everybody would win. Everybody would win. It's really hard. It takes a little bit of extra time. It takes a little bit of extra energy. People are going to wear your edges down. They're going to, they're going to say, why, why is there so many kids on the ice? Why aren't you working on the power play? How come so-and-so played in the game and didn't come to practice? The parents will beat you down. They'll wear your edges off every day. But do it right, do it well for your own kid, okay? Because it'll make a huge difference in their lives. And hopefully, they maybe aspire to get to a certain level, whether it's the high school team or make the Bantam team, whatever their goals are. But hopefully, 20 years from now, your kids are sitting in a room like this listening to somebody talk about hockey because they're giving back to the game that they love. They're so passionate about the sport, they're in it for the rest of their lives, okay? So here's the numbers. This is what makes us really nervous. 16 NHL players from Mass with 48,000, 33 for 39,000, 77 for 41,000. There's a reason why. You go over there, it's the individual athlete. It's building the base of skills at a young age so that their athletes, when they do get older, and it does become important to win medals and, and win games, they have the ability to do it. We just want a bigger pool, okay? We want a bigger pool of, of high-end players. We want more kids playing, playing longer, and being better. That's it. Passion and development. Fun and development. That's it. End the story. Okay? So for you guys, what makes a good coach? There's two critical things. Understand the age that you're coaching and age-appropriate training and, and development, and be patient. You can't speed farm. Okay? You can't put a seed in the ground and expect it's going to be a full-grown plant in a year. It takes years and years and years to do it right. A lot of hard work and a ton of patience. And so you got to look at your child like, the, what's the end result? What do I want them to be when they're 15, 16, 18, 20? Not what I want them to be next week. Because they're going to fail. And you want them to fail. You want to embrace failure. You want to encourage failure. Because that's how they learn. And so if it's too safe, if it's too easy, and they're afraid to fail, they'll never reach their, their full potential. Okay, so how you create that environment is really critical. And so here, whatever age, who's coaching mites next year? Okay, they're in their suppleness window. Okay, mites and first year squirts, suppleness, their athleticism. So all you're trying to do is build an athlete. You're not trying to build a hockey player, you're trying to build an athlete. So their balance, coordination, agility is absolutely critical absolutely critical so that's why we're encouraging multi-sport athletes at a young age so they can reach back on that athleticism piece that's why we don't want kids playing hockey year-round when they're little that comes when they get older okay but we want to build little athletes how many squirt peewee coaches do we have here so your focus is on late window of athleticism and the golden age of skill development so you're now, your focus is still building athletes, but now you're thinking about touches and repetitions and building that base of skills. Because guess what? Like I said before, you don't get to get to here and hit reset. You can have individuals. There's a reason why coaches have an individual skill sessions, because his kids are deficient. I've never heard an NHL scout or a college coach say, 
My guys are too skilled. That guy's way too skilled. Way too skilled. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take some of that skill away. Right? There's no such thing. So let's go overboard on the skill development because that's something that you can't replace and you don't get to hit reset. And these are, these are what, these are what the, the, the coach in the back there is working on with his college athletes. But he's working with, with adults in, the most, in most cases. Not even some of them are adults yet, right? But the, the conditioning, getting in shape, getting stronger, getting faster, those are adult principles. You can't force that into a little kid. Why do you think we went, why do you think we're begging you to go to cross ice and small area stuff? Take a five-year-old kid, put him in a pool. Take a 15-year-old kid, put him in a pool. Tell him to go underwater. Who's going to pop up out of the water every time first? The five-year-old. Why? Lung capacity. It's just physics. It's the human body. They can't maintain quality for 200 feet. It's impossible. So why are we putting them in an adult world? It doesn't work. That's why cross ice and small area stuff is so important for young kids. Because we want quality. We don't want quantity, we want quality. And for their bodies to sustain quality, it's got to be a smaller space. It's got to be half. He's got 30 guys my size and his size every day. You got maybe, you're in charge of maybe 12 to 15, half the size of us. So how you train them is way different than how we would train the older kids, okay? The decision-making part, the mental part of it, really starts to kick in up here at the top end, but there can never be enough of that stuff. Putting kids in situations where they have to think and they have to make a decision, and there's conflict. Because I can skate around a cone all day, but that cone isn't gonna move. Our kids aren't playing pond hockey, they're not playing street hockey, it's probably not coming back. So we gotta bring that inside. And so all that decision-making and that conflict that if I, don't, if I try to skate, I can tell you coach pulls his hair off his head because he's probably got half his forwards are going to attack a defenseman and try to toe drag him and break down the defenseman straight on instead of using the space on either side. Why? Because we do a lot of stuff when they're younger around a cone that doesn't move. So we attack the defender. We don't attack the open space, we attack the defender. And yet we're the hypocrites because guess what? That cone's probably this far off the ground and where's the kid's head? It's looking at the cone so he doesn't step on it instead of looking up and trying to find space around the outside with a, an adult that's got a six foot, seven foot, eight foot reach, plus a stick. So we've got to do stuff that's realistic, that's game-like, okay? That where, where if I don't do it right, the consequence is I don't get to have the puck, right? But that's why when you build your stations and you build your teams, likability goes against likability. We don't need Johnny who's really good going one-on-one -on -one with Joey, who's just a beginner or, or a little bit on the weaker side. We want Joey going with Billy, who's almost identical. And we want the, so we want the better players battling the better players, the weaker players battling the weaker players as often as we can. We want to build confidence and make sure our weaker players are getting touches and repetitions and getting better. We want our better players to fail. That's why the better your player is probably the better skater, the less space you give them. You give a good skater space, you just gave him the answers to the test. Kid can already skate. He's already got natural ability. That's why in our, in, our, in, our, in our sport and a lot of youth sports, the really naturally young, gifted players never really become the great older players because we don't handicap them. We don't force the really good skater to use their head to use their hands because they just dominate because they're faster. And that's why if you watch big time soccer, you watch big time hockey practices, the best coaches know how to handicap their better players and force them to fail and use other aspects of their game rather than their just their physical prowess. And they build up their confidence of their weaker players because they put them in a situation where they're gonna have a little bit more success. That's the art of coaching. That's what separates the good coach. That's what separates the coach from the teacher. Because I can blow a whistle, I can set up a drill, but am my kids actually learning something and getting better? That's the, that's the art of coaching. And that's what's, that's what's critical, okay? So we won't get into that. So here, 
Here's practice with the Penguins. Okay, Stanley Cup champions. They got bumpers out, for God's sakes. God forbid we'd ever take those black bumpers out because they're a pain in the butt to deal with. But we got the coaching staff of the Penguins pulling out bumpers, okay, and doing small spatial stuff in here. Keep away. Cross-ice game, cross-ice game, okay? And you go to his practice, you go to the Province Bruins practice, you go to the Bruins practice, you go to the Stanley Cup champions practice, I guarantee you, 90% of the stuff they do is going to be something similar to this. It's going to be skill development, it's going to be touches and repetitions, it's going to be competition, and it's going to be small spatial stuff. Because that's the way the game is played. And it's all based on analytics. I was telling uh, Coach earlier, we've been doing a ton of stuff with analytics. And we're all consumed with skating, like skating. If you can skate, you can, you can play, right? So they did a study on how many times an NHL player hits max speed. How many times do you think an NHL player in a game hits max speed? Zero. Doesn't happen. There's not enough space. Does not important how fast I can go from goal line to goal line. How fast can I go from here to the wall and then get out? That's this, that's this, that's this, and that's this. Hard to coach those. I can make a kid faster if he's got passion and he wants to compete. So how we manage the young kids is really, really critical. So here's some of the things that you want, I want you to think about as you go into the year. You have to be on the best team to develop. Absolutely false. You have to excel early. False. You have to play hockey 12 months a year. I work for USA Hockey. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay? You must specialize in hockey before the age of 12. Those two go hand in hand. You have to travel extensively to improve, and you must play more games. You just heard what his training schedule is like with some of the best athletes in this area for our sport. We got to get closer to that. That's why these guys want to become a model club. Okay? I would strongly encourage you to download the free app on your iPhone called the Mobile Coach. And I would really encourage you as a coach, because if I went back to coach college hockey again, my assistants or my trainer or somebody on my staff would track every practice I did. So that if I thought today in practice I was trying to accomplish something, that the numbers actually proved out that I accomplished that. Whether I wanted my guys to become a better passer, if I wanted to, if I, skating was an issue, okay, how long do I talk? Am I really sucking the life out of them by overcoaching? Okay, how much time do I actually spend with a kid saying, hey, you might want to do this, little coach's feedback one on one, okay, which is way more productive than this, okay? And then how much time are they handling the puck and how many shots they get in a practice? Because I might think I'm, I'm delivering something because it looks good on paper, but when I actually implement it on the ice, it might be the complete opposite. I would ask you in a 60 minute practice, when we go around the country and we track these practices, what do you think the average amount of time a kid skates in practice? 60 minute practice. How, how, what do you think the average number of activity when we track practices? Nine minutes. 60 minute commitment on the ice doesn't include driving, getting dressed, and driving home for nine minutes of activity. That's, that's a foul bunt on a, on a third strike bunt attempt. That's failure as a coach. It's hard to get to 20 minutes. It's really hard. But that's why station-based practices are so critical because you got smaller numbers, you got higher activity, and it's about when they're little, you're building athletes, so you want them active. You don't want them standing in line. You want the work to rest ratio to be one to one, one to two. When they get to his guy's age, it's one to three, one to four, so you're simulating the game. But I see practices where the work to rest ratio is one to 10. I've seen practices where it's one to 13, 14, where they had to wait 13 players to get to the next drill because that's how long the line is. Happens all the time. But think about what you're doing in practice. Have the confidence to have somebody track you so that you're delivering to your child, to your child. You're going to spend three hours driving them to the rink, getting them dressed, driving them home, practicing, that you're not delivering nine minutes of skating to your own child because that's not going to make it happen. 
That's not going to work. And guys, I look back at what I was doing when my kid was younger and my inability to help my own kid. Don't make that mistake. I lived it. Don't make it. Okay? This is what we talked about before, flow versus conflict. Tons of flow, tons of skating around circles, tons of skating around open space, tons of puck handling in open space around cones. Let's do, let's do more of this. Okay? I was fortunate enough, I, I may have told some of you this story, I ran the Winter Classic for the NHL when it was at Gillette. So I was fortunate enough to go up to the stadium three times going up to the event. And it just happened that the Patriots were um, practicing for their last uh, regular season game. So I'm underneath and I see all the players go by, I see the coaches go by. So I knew the guy that runs the facility, because he used to be the commissioner of the ECAC when I coached college hockey, Phil Buttafuoco. I said, Phil, can I watch practice? He goes, we can't go anywhere near the field because we will, I'll get fired. But we can go upstairs and we can watch the glass. So we went upstairs. He brought me up there three days in a row and watched practice. And what blew me away watching the Patriots in a game that meant nothing, they were really getting ready for the playoffs, was the practice wasn't physically demanding, but it was emotionally and mentally ridiculously demanding. This whole practice was this. It was conflict resolution. Let's step in all the potholes Monday through Saturday so we don't step in them on Sunday. Those guys are so prepared mentally and emotionally because all they do is conflict. It's conflict, 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 conflict. There's no, there's no, safe, there's no safe zone in practice because he wants that to happen on Sunday. And it just, it just reconfirmed why, to me as a guy who's in player development now, why that organization is so good. It's how they train. It's how they train. Doesn't yell at them, doesn't scream at them, holds them accountable to the right thing in practice every day. Part of the reason why he has individual skill sessions is because he's trying to break a lot of bad habits his athletes have. His best athletes at this level have a ton of bad habits because <laughs> They were the best players. They could get away with it. And now everybody can skate. Everybody's pretty strong. He's got to hold them accountable to the right stuff every day. And it's not easy to do because we want practice to look good. We want it to look perfect. We want mom and dad to say, oh, look at how structured that is. That's really good, right? But sometimes the best practices look the worst from up top because it's chaos. And that's what the game is. The game of hockey is chaos. So embrace it, OK? I wanted to show you this because this was part of the, the real big reason why I was here. This is, this is where the Europeans are absolutely kicking our butts. It's the off-ice piece. These are 10-year-olds up above the Arctic Circle in a town called Romanecki where I was for a week and a half. This is 35 minutes before practice is three days a week. I want you to watch these little 10-year-olds and their footwork and their athleticism at that age. And if they commit this to three days a week from the time they're five, six years old. This is in the lobby of the rink. Nothing fancy. Benches, a little pad here to do some tumbling. They're doing somersaults. They're doing cartwheels, doing all kinds of stuff. They have four stations, the station-based off-ice practice, tumbling, footwork, and then down over here you can see they're doing some core stuff, some like body weight strength stuff a little bit here, okay? They got the music blaring, kids wearing a sweater vest, not a $250 sweatsuit. So, it doesn't need to be perfect, but how effective is it when you can just build little athletes, okay? It makes a huge, huge, huge difference. These are 14-year-olds in their national camp that we helped them run uh, two years ago. This is in February in a town called Veramaki, and, and I was just back there two weeks ago. Uh, and they're just doing body weight stuff. And, and the beauty of this, this little drill here they're doing with them is not only are they doing hand-eye coordination, you know, agility, but they're asking them questions. So there's a mental component to it as well. There's a decision-making component to it as well. So as they're being active, they're actually having to think and answer a question. As simple as what's your name? And you should see when the kids first do it, they, they, like, they, can't, they can't talk, think, move the ball, and move their feet at the same time. But if you do it enough, it becomes second nature. And so I would just strongly encourage you as an association, again, for your own kids' sake, in the, 
most of these associations were either in the lobby in the corner of the rink or if the rink wouldn't let them do it inside, they were out in the parking lot in the snow in February. <laughs> they didn't miss a beat. I ran the practice for this 10-year-old this group, and I was panicking as an American coach going, we're on the ice in 10 minutes, guys, and they're still doing this. I go, and they're looking at me, the Finnish coaches are like, well, what are you worried about? I go, 10 minutes, we're on the ice in 10 minutes. It's going to take me 18 to get dressed. I go, in the United States, these, our, my, our kids need a good half hour. They go, five minutes. I, I leave, I'm getting my skates on, I can hear pucks hitting the glass. I'm like, what? Kids are already on the ice. It's just part of their culture. Go to the rink, do my off ice, get dressed, get on the ice, have some fun, go home. Next practice, same thing, same thing, same thing. It's a game changer. And why is it a game changer? because they've understood sports science for a long time in long-term athletic development. These kids are in their window of athleticism. Build the machine. There's a reason why gymnastics is an early development sport. Why? Because the suppleness is the first window. So the more tumbling, the more footwork, agility, jumping, balance stuff you do, the better they're going to be, and it's just going to translate onto the ice. Okay? This has got to... If, if you're going to be a model club and you're going to really have an impact on your kids, this is, this is the biggest thing you can add to your programming that this coming uh, fall is this. This will make a difference. And the reason why it's so important is because if you go to a, your kid's local school, I guarantee you they're probably having PE once a week, twice a week. Lucky if they're three times a week. It's all, it's all gone. They're not doing tumbling. They're not doing presidential fitness tests. They're not doing any of that stuff anymore. So they're not getting it. And I would ask you, those of you that are coaching squirts and peewees, go home and ask your kid to do a forward somersault. Close your eyes, put a neck brace on them, because it's going to be ugly. Ask them to do a cartwheel. We do it with our national team kids, and it is frightening. I bet you if he asked his guys to do a cartwheel, it would be scary. And you could pick out, what's that? Shooting a basketball is scary. It's amazing, isn't it? They're just not, they're not, they're not athletes anymore. And you can have a huge impact on them by, by doing some of this other stuff, okay? Because look at, here's some of our best 14 and 16 year olds. So you think I was joking. These are some of our top junior players out in the Midwest. Columbus Junior Blue Jackets. Look at these two, look at ketchup and mustard. <laughs> Six former NHL players kids in this, in this thing. And they were mortified. Mortified, former Blue Jackets players. Watch this poor kid down here. Does not know how to do a somersault. Coach Mancini has to go down and grab his head and flip him over. Now, you know David Crusoe at all? Yeah. So David's their coach, right? So this is the U16, U14, Columbus Junior Blue Jackets. I was in, this, this would have been a year ago last uh, May, I was in Detroit at a honey bake tournament. These guys were playing in it. And the coach grabbed me. We went out in the parking lot. He made his kids do that same thing. Same group of kids. He was so embarrassed that he, that he, impl he implemented that into his everyday practice. And he had him doing it on the asphalt in the parking lot at honey bake in Detroit, Michigan, just to show me that he got the message. Okay? He knows we show this, and he's a little embarrassed. <laughs> but I guarantee you, those of you that are coaching your peewees and bantams, I guarantee you it's going to look that or worse. It's frightening. So if we can start it at a young age, and that's part of the model club piece, it's absolutely critical. Okay? Dave already talked about this with his team, but this is our national program. Okay? 130 practices, 100 off ice, 50 games. It has a huge impact. Huge impact. Okay? So here, here's some of the things for each age group. Okay, commitment to the individual athlete, fun, activity-based practices and games, cocoon and build passion, build the base of athleticism both on and off the ice, patience and undercoach. What do you mean by cocoon? Protect it. Don't feed it. Like I have parents all the time come up to me when they're young, coach, and they say, but my kid likes going to the rink. He likes playing hockey. How old is he? Seven. Go, does he really like chocolate? Yeah, are you going to give it to him every day just because he likes it? No. Because you want that 7-year-old when he's 15, 16 to go, okay, now I want to go to the rink every day. I want to go see 
a strength coach. I want to train now. I want to do the extra stuff to take that next step. It takes passion. If we feed the passion monster at a young age, they burn out too soon. So we just got to be patient with it. We got to cocoon it. Okay? Does that make sense? So 10 you, 12 you. Okay? Again, remember, you're in the skill development, optimal skill development. Okay? Train, training. Get as a model club. Get your parents and, and coaches all to grasp the training piece. Training is what separates the good from the great. Anybody can go play games, like Coach said. Okay? But some reason practice has become broccoli and and you know the games has become pizza. And I get it. But in reality wise, especially since the pond and the unstructured stuff's gone away, like in my generation. I could go to a coach and he could teach me where to stand and, and do the team stuff in the rink. Because my generation, we spent 20 hours a week doing it on our own. We got all that. It's not happening anymore. So we got to make sure we're bringing that into our, our culture with our associations. Okay? 14U, 16U, okay? Decision making, even a little bit earlier than that, really critical. Give me a really smart player who makes good decisions. Who has passion? I can coach can make them faster and stronger, but man, it's hard to make them smarter. It's really hard to make them smarter. Okay, so really grasping that and, and, and embracing training the brain, putting them in situations where they have to think and make decisions visually and emotionally. Quality. Okay, when you get start coaching a little bit, those of you that are coaching bantams and peewees, you're getting a little bit away from now the quantity and you're looking for quality, so they're doing it right. There's no reason to do it if it's wrong, doing it right, just like a good math teacher. You're not doing that right, it's gonna hurt you. Like we're in algebra, you're gonna get the calculus. If you can't figure this out now, the base isn't there. Okay, so making sure that they got some of that and do it right. And remember, when you get up to this age, the responsibility for development switches over to the athlete. It's their responsibility at that time, okay? Guys, this is my email address. That's my cell phone number. Any of this stuff I have is yours. Any way I can help you individually as a coach, I'm certainly here to help support, you know, the association and, and Coach Berard and his support of you guys. That's why I'm here tonight. I'm your regional manager. And listen, one of the things you got to do, and, and you're crazy if you don't, first thing I'd do if I was you, whatever team you're coaching, have a parents meeting, email me and ask me for this and explain to them why. Why you're focusing on touches and repetitions. Why? Because they're in the skill window. Hey, the one big mistake you can make, and I figured this out a long time ago. I have a, we have a family curse. I'm going to go visit it on Thursday. And, and the family curse is you don't know who on your team is going to be the next great athlete. You might think you know, but you don't know. My dad kicked Bob Dylan out of his high school band. He just won a Nobel Peace Prize. The first musician ever to win a Nobel. Dad, how do you kick a Nobel Peace Prize winner out of your high school band, for God's sake? Well, he was a weirdo. He, was, he was, didn't have any talent. He didn't have any talent. He wrote some pretty good songs. I th think you could have benefited from a couple of those. I certainly could have benefited from a couple of those. Okay. <laughs> I might be living in Malibu, not sitting here at Holy Cross with Coach Berhard, okay? But the point is, that was a guy who was 18 years old. They thought they knew what he was. You don't know. So don't ever say to a parent, your kid's not very good. Don't put your hand in the lion's den. Use their passion for their kid to be good. Use it against them. You want your kid to play in the NHL? When I meet with parents, I say, do you want your kid to play in the NHL? Nobody raises their hand. I tell them they're all full of shit. <laughs> oh, you don't, you don't want your kid to make a couple million dollars playing the sport they love? <laughs> I'll sign up for that right now, right? But there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And most of the guys that we watch, most of them, not all, but most of them were in what we would call a talent pool. Or they were in a culture where things were done right. There's some genetics to it, as for certainly, but there's also an environmental piece to it as well. Most of them are considered late bloomers, okay? Because they weren't the greatest player when they were 10. 
I know the guys I coached weren't. St. Louis, Timmy Thomas, Johnny LeClaire. Those guys weren't the best player when they were 10. In fact, St. Louis and, and Thomas, Timmy Thomas, nobody wanted them. They were castaways. Talking about a Hall of Famer, a two-time Vezina Trophy winner, a Stanley Cup champion, a Conn Smythe champion. Like, nobody knew. So the environment you put the weakest player in your association and the best player is exactly the same up until the age of about 13 and 14. It's the same. There's a reason why there's no honors courses in elementary school. You don't go to honors math when you're in third grade. You sit in the same classroom with the kid who struggles. Same thing in new sports. The environment's the same for the best as it is for the weakest. Now, you manage it within the culture of your organization. But this mentality that we've got to separate and the best have to do more is absolutely insane. And that's what we've got to change. Okay? Any questions? Because I'd love to have some interaction with you guys and with Coach Bernard as well on some of your thoughts or questions about your, your team, Practices, anything that, that, that might come up. Yeah. The first slide you put up had you know, you know, statistics of players from Massachusetts of 48,000. Yep. 16 in the NFL. And then you went to different countries. Yep. Is USA Hockey um, analyzing whether or not this ADM is actually working? Yep. Or should we be more? focus on what other countries are doing with their, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? The ADM is based on what the other countries are doing. That's where it came from. It came from Sweden, the <coughs> two best hockey countries in the world right now by far. Based on what they're doing with what they have, yeah. by a mile. It'd be like, it'd be like uh, U.S. soccer studying in Brazil. It'd be like artists going to uh, Florence, Italy, figuring out why all those great artists came from that or part of the world. And so the focus over in, in Sweden and Finland, so there's seven of me for 350,000 kids. Sweden's got 22 of me. And they go to the practices and they watch your practice and they go, nope, come here. You go sit in the stands. You wanna do it right? You coach. That's how committed they are to this. Individual athletes, skill-based, station-based, Cross ice hockey till the age of 11, blue puck till the age of 10. They don't mess around. You don't do it, you don't play. Sorry. It's the way they do it. They're 15 year olds. How many times now, this is where it gets a little bit off the track, but when they get to 15, how many practices a week do you think their 15 year olds get? Eight. Skate before school, individual skill base, just like he does with his players and the players come up with their own action plan, and then their team practice after school. Eight practices a week, two games in a weekend. That's how committed they are to training. It works. If you go to all the big time soccer academies over in Europe, it's all station based. It's all individual skill based. Why? Because the transfer fees, who the one guy transfer, who's the soccer guy here? Who the one guy gets, it's some of this paid like what, 175 million just to get the guy? Not to mention his contract. Yeah, the prison system you know, Brazilian who got signed over to Spain. Yeah. For, yeah 100, 175 million just, Euro, so just to get him. Euro, which would be like 300. 300, yeah. Just to get the guy. That doesn't include what they're going to pay him. So what the, all the, the, the big clubs in, in Europe have to do now is develop from within. So they can either sell the players or they can use them themselves without having to pay all this crazy money to get a high end player. So it's. The training's been based off of science and off a of need. If I'm a country of only 39,000 players, and I gotta compete against Canada and the US with 500,000 or 350,000, I've gotta be really good at what I do as far as development, otherwise I got no chance. That's why they're so good. So yeah, our, this entire program is based on what's happening in other countries. So to Roger's point, <clears throat> You know, from from our perspective as Holy Cross, like we have, yeah, we have, we have eight challenges in our competition with the schools we compete against. 
So we played non-league last year. We played four of the last five national champions in our non-league schedule. We played BC, Providence, Yale, Union, and then we played Notre Dame uh, in our non-league schedule. And we have the Heart Center, and I'm sure you guys have seen BC's rank, Providence's rank, Notre Dame's rank, 55, 60 million dollar facilities. We only have 14 scholarships, those schools have 18. Their budgets blow ours away. My salary and my two assistant salaries might not equal one of their assistant coaches' salaries. So we have all of these challenges. So how do we win? We beat Providence two to one in overtime. We beat Union six to four. We lost a one goal game to Notre Dame. How do we do, how do, we do this against those teams? It's by adopting the philosophy that Roger just talked about with Finland. So we're, we're just like Finland in comparison to the teams that we play against. So what do we do? We invest in player development. Because if we can make our players better over the course of the year, then a guy at BC gets better, then we're gonna have a better team, we're gonna have a shot. That's gonna close the gap. Because you know what, when you have the best talent, you might not think you have to develop them. You just kind of flow practice and get through it. Well, if we did that, we would get killed. So how do you compete? How do you win? You make your players better. So to Roger's point, that's the philosophy that we've adopted as a program. That gives us the best chance to win, not only within our league, but when we compete against teams nationally. There was a study that USA Hockey did. Roger pointed out a study that they, that they did recently. But in 04, in the Salt Lake City Olympics, Canada played the US in the gold medal game. And if you remember Joe Sackett, Joe Sackett was named the most outstanding player of the Olympics that year. In that game, Joe Sackett had two goals and two assists. Canada beat the US 5-2. to two. How long did Joe Sackett have the puck in his stick that game? Someone take a guess. 60 minute gold medal game, best player in the Olympics. How long do you think he had the puck in his stick? Eight minutes? Nope. Minute 20 seconds. Minute 20 seconds. So, Roger, I, I think when we were back in Rhode Island, Roger was coaching Brown, I was working at Providence. We had that study. And what we did is we translate that to youth hockey. So now look at Jimmy Smith, who's an eight year old, who's just learning to skate. How much time is he going to have a puck in his stick in a practice or in a meeting? If you just throw him to the wolves, like Roger said. So, that guy might never end up being that late bloomer or that guy that emerges as a peewee and bantam because after that first year, he's so discouraged. It's like, why do I want to go to the rink and have my feet freezing cold and get hit and fall down and hurt my elbow? I'll just go play another sport and not play at all. So to your point, when you talk about you know, the ADM, is it working? As a country, we haven't adopted that philosophy. <laughs> If we adopt that philosophy as a, let's just start here as this organization, if you adopt that philosophy, you're going to start to see gains that you wouldn't see if you did something else. And I think as a country, if we can, if the, the ADM is growing and spreading, more organizations are doing it, and it's starting to see the result. But as a country, we're not, we're Finland and Sweden as, as far as there, this is what we do, this is how we do it, take it or leave it. We're moving in that direction, but I think with all the successes that we've had, if we can adopt that at the younger levels, we're going to have way more guys playing at the NHL level. I'm going to get a better athlete at the college level for sure. And I'm not going to go be doing a time warp and starting to do drills that kids should have done at 9 and 10 years old in my practices. I'd probably still do it anyway, but we do that as a result of they are deficient when we get them. So we're trying to train a 22-year-old. It's a lot easier to train an eight and a nine-year-old than it is a 22-year-old. Believe me, you know. And we, we talk about we talk about the athleticism of kids. We put our guys on a basketball court. You you have them play softball, catch a catch a baseball. You'd be shocked. Big, strong, highly big, strong Division One athletes. They can lift the weight room. They're fast. They're explosive. They're powerful. And you do a simple thing like catching a baseball, and it looks like a foreign object. So anything that you can do to increase their athleticism, to get them more touches, to get them more, have more fun, is going to pay 
dividends for them in the sport and, and getting better, but it's also going to pay dividends for a guy like me that's looking for great players 10 years from now. So that's, that was just my two cents on that. Is there another question? Somebody had a hand up uh, It was just the explanation. I mean, I follow you. It's going to be five years now plus with the ADM and all, yep. all that. And I was just, you know, you guys kind of touched on it, but the metrics of how close we are to competing with the Vince and the Swedes as far as you know, over you know, the last just, five years we've been chasing. We just we just broke we just broke a record this past year. We won four goals out of the six events. Yeah. So World Junior, U18, Women's Nat, uh, World Championships, and I'm uh, missing one. And, uh, I'm missing one. But we, it's never been done before. So we're let's put it this way. I was I'm, I've been asked by the International Ice Hockey Federation to be a mentor coach. Um, Instead of us now stealing from Finland and Sweden, I'm going up to Hockey Canada to speak. For the first time ever, Hockey Canada is now reaching down south to see what's happening, and they're, they're scared. And the, the Europeans are willing to share, but they look at us all the time and say, kind of like what the coach just said, if, if you guys really ever figure this out, we're screwed. I mean, we, had, we, we have an advantage now. Because you do play full ice at 800, you do do some crazy, to their minds, absolutely crazy things from a development standpoint. But if you guys do figure this out, then we have no chance because the, 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 the people that are in charge of Olympic development sports, there's three major factors to a country that's going to dominate the Olympics. One is population, two is money, and three is the development system. So they, we're there right now in the U.S. China is on fire in almost everything. That's why you're seeing China dominate golf right now. Dominate golf. They weren't even in golf 10 years ago, right? And the next up-and-coming country that we've been told to be scared of and everything is India. Because they're putting money in. they got the numbers of people. China's making a huge push in ice hockey. Huge push. You want a job coaching hockey? You can go make some big money over in China right now because they're going to host the Olympics and they want they want to make a splash. So, it, it, but you need a system, and that's what this is. It's a system, and you don't have to buy into 100% of it. But the practice part, the the conceptual, philosophical, sports science piece, it's not arguable. I just remember two years ago when you spoke to us, you said we're on the, you know, the doors got their coattails, if you will, so it sounds like we're making We're back. getting, we're, we're there, we, we want to be, we want to win all six. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I know it's uh, getting late, and I, I feel like I can listen to you guys talking all night about this stuff. We're, we're doing so much great work <clears throat> to develop the model that uh, I feel like
Aaron Moy, everyone. So, uh, Mike Comino with uh, Peak Fitness Performance Training. Uh, Paul Lee, is actually one of my partners at Peak. Um, I mentioned the, the restaurants, but that's not why I'm here tonight. Uh, I couldn't, I don't know, Roger, or, or Coach, but uh, that's a great intro for when we're talking about strength and conditioning. I feel like I should basically give you shares to the, to the facility there. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, have, we have a current facility, uh, Peak uh, uh, Fitness uh, Performance Training on Plantation Street right now in Worcester. We do both the adult functional fitness model as well as sports performance. Uh, made a commitment in the new Worcester Ice Center, um, dedicated to sports performance. Um, so we're 9,000 square feet. We overlook uh, two rings. We overlook ring two. Um, so it's a beautiful facility there. So what we're hoping to do is partner up and collaborate with, with your organization to offer team training. Exactly what we're talking about. Our commitment to long-term athletic development. We know well. We understand kids develop at different ages. So I saw I saw fun and movement and stations. That's exactly what we do with our team training. Uh, our, our, our goal, our, our focus is to get, some, get to know all the coaches in the organization, get to know which programs, what age levels. We make it age specific, but again, you know, eight, nine year old kids, 10 year old kids, 12 year old kids. It's, uh, you know, it's a progression in terms of resistance and things of that nature, but they're in their movement and they're, they're going through their stations um, to, to fit into this model exactly. Uh, our goal is to piggyback it off of the rest time Right, to make it convenient. I think uh, with these types of things, it's, there's a convenience component. Parents are coming to the facility. Um, you're there for two hours instead of one hour, but it's better than maybe coming multiple days. Maybe. So we're a big component of so getting kids in, moving, moving to their stations, and then getting out there on the ice. Hopefully, uh, they will get ready in five minutes. And the less probably will probably like, wow, that's out. <laughs> so uh, maybe we do a 50 minute session and we'll give them 10 or 12 to start. And we'll work the culture from our end too in terms of you know attitude and hustle. Uh, all they gotta do is go right down the stairs and they're in the ring and they're in the locker room. The locker rooms are right below our facility. Um, we've designed our facility to handle the flow of team training. So if you have two teams on the ice, right, and about 30 kids, and we're designed to handle that so we can kind of create a flow throughout the night. Kids are coming in and moving through, going through stations. So we have um, not only do we have uh, Trend conditioning stations with you know, uh, 35 yards of turf, you know, rotational power area, hydrant, you know, strength zone, uh, big open area. We have actually about a thousand square feet of uh, shooting lanes and some things like that. So there's it's great for coaches to help participate too. So uh, in this sort of long-term model, when you're coming in for multiple weeks, we're sort of you know uh, in team training, we're sort of analyzing the players over time. Right? So what we call it uh, exercises to master. We, we get to notice kids over time. Again, we're not labeling kids, but we can see which kids are moving well and picking up moving patterns faster than others. We can progress and progress, keep it fun, uh, and keep kids um, you know, excited about being there, not, ah, this is easy, we keep doing the same thing every week. So we're constantly progressing and taking them through. The coaches can participate, they can help us with uh, watching the kids improve. We, we want to prove it to you. Why, you know, just, just like this model, you want to say, how does this correlate to on ice performance, right? It's all for injury prevention, but we're, we're certainly trying to improve performance too. Um, but you know, a, a big measure of our success is reducing you know, non-contact injuries on the ice, right? Groins, and pulls, and that nature. So we're taking them through moving patterns. We're trying to prevent overuse, trying to get them to move in multiple planes in multiple directions. So when they get on the ice, they're ready to go, nice and loose, not get hurt, and then hopefully that correlates into wow, change of direction, speed, curve of the you know, transition. Those are the types of things. Thank you. 
through all those conditions now, we make their way out downstairs, get out here on the you know, floor after practice. You know, this uh, the floor is sounds great. I think some of the issues with the floor are you have five o'clock ice time, you like, ah, I can't get there, uh, and then if it's after and you have eight o'clock ice time, you're like, ah, I wish I could go before. So those are things that we need to kind of flush out in terms of I think. Um, there's probably benefit to both. Both I don't know. How, how do you see that, Rod? Do you promote the floor? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of them rings down are pretty facilities like this, which is fantastic. And I strongly encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, and doing it on the same night as a practice is an absolute no brainer because you don't want mom and dad to get in the car and drive another day to the ring. Um, and before or after is exactly what you said, depending on when it is. And making sure that the, the, the works for the drivers you know and, and then the other thing I would say is what's gonna happen I can guarantee you when you sign up for something like this is some kids are gonna take advantage of it some kids aren't and my suggestion to you guys is don't lose sleep over it. I, I would I would I would personally build it into the this is what's happening in a lot of places in the country build it into their tuition already and if you don't take advantage of it they're only hurting themselves I agree. I agree with Roger. My my two kids play for South Shore Kings. They play at Foxborough. In Foxborough, they have that EPS facility. Ryan McDonough. It's a great facility. It's Patriots like a lot of athletes train there. A lot of pro athletes, um, and they build it into their tuition. So my younger one, because they practiced early, they would do their training after practice. It worked out for the driver, which was my wife most times, because then my older one would be off ice when the younger one was on the ice, and then my older one would be on the ice, my younger one was off ice, and then they all leave together. But it was, like Roger said, there's there's kids that show up to do it, and then there's other kids, they don't see the value in it, or parents don't see the value in it, but that comes down to that passion part, and that comes to how bad you want it, and how bad you want to utilize the resources you have to get better. So, like some of the, some of the things you'll do with eight-year-olds is a lot different than you're gonna do with 13, 14 year old, but it's all the point if you can do it. Optimally, Ollie, we like to do our stuff before practice because it gets them thinking and uh, gets them warmed up, but just doing something is better than doing nothing. You know, what happens after, you know, it's still better. Yeah, one would argue whether it's you're using it as a dynamic warm up and you're kind of feeding it. Either way, we're talking about in season team training, so it's sort of a mental component. We're not destroying them for game day. This isn't like you know, we're going to do overhead squats. You know, that's not what we're doing, right? So we're doing movement back. So we're, our, our goal is to be fresh, we're ready to go, we're ready to get on the ice and practice, and optimize and maximize the practice, and then be ready to go for game day. So that's what this condition is designed for. It's designed for that long term effort. Well, the kids here, especially at that age, you know, I have a I have a 15 year old who looks like he's a 13 year old. He doesn't know that. He's got a shave, he's small, doesn't have a hair on his eyes. He's got St. John's with kids that are a year, full year older than him and are much developed. It's a, it's a totally different thing. You know? So it's, we see that a lot with these, with these teenage kids. You, know, you have to you know, be able to play to that and, and not throw the towel in on some kids that aren't that happen. It's not like, okay, that kid's big and strong, so that's the one we're going to focus on. What about this other kid that eight months from now, nine months from now, all of a sudden it's starting to come into that. Now they're getting less attention, less focus. So I encourage you to, again, yeah, not label them, get them involved. I mean, the coaches drive the bus, right? That's the bottom line. If you're going back as coaches to parents and saying, hey, watch that you believe in it, you really like to have your kids there. Our job, especially in the first year, because it's not public first of all, is to make it very affordable, right? So we're trying to drive numbers so that we can make it affordable. We gotta put coaches on the floor, good quality coaches. I'm a, I'm a physical therapist and a strength and conditioning specialist. All of the PT and strength and conditioning specialist. All of my coaches all have four year degrees in this for exercise science or kinesiology. They're all what, what, uh, certified strength and conditioning specialists. These are, these are like high level coaches. So we have to put a lot of coaches. We have interns, we have a bunch of stuff on the floor. But, so we need some numbers to be able to drive that price down for you. So it's like, this is a no brainer. So that down the road, after this first year, we want you to say, how much that's it for the season? Like $100 or less to make it part of the tuition model? 
that, that's why we think it's a no-brainer to do that. So we're trying hard. Like right now, uh, September, the facility is still being built. We're getting on the ice. We have some time blocks at night and on the weekends that we can offer for team training at our existing facility. Um, and then when the new facility opens in October, we'll already be on the ice there. We want to offer those first four weeks. Bring your teams and encourage them all to come. We'll offer, offer as well. Just come in and check it out. We want them to get to see it, feel it, touch it. You know, like, wow, this is part of the culture of playing hockey for this program. We train, right? This is it. This is how we get ready to go. Um, I think that they'll see the value in it. I think you as coaches and organizations will see the value in it. And I think it ties exactly into what the model is. You know, and I'd love to tell you if everybody's plus minus is going to get better. I mean, Right, but, uh, hopefully they'll have fun. They'll say, "Wow, I like it. I love this program. I like what you offer." We want again. We want coaches to be involved, and it's not like, "Ah, get out of here, we're gonna coach." You know, come on in, hang out, do the workouts, move with us. It's a good time. So, I think, yeah, I think two things I just clarified there, um, because as I've done the CEPs, I've done that as an online model of training with Roger. This is something we're depriving our, our athletes of right now. Uh, and it, I think it's a lot due to uh, the, the culture and, and the rinks that we play in. Uh, Lake Ave and, and Auburn aren't necessarily conducive to uh, off-ice workouts. Uh, I'm hoping that working with uh, Jeff and uh, with Mike this year that we start to figure out how to put in some of those simple uh, systems, some of those simple uh, dry man uh, training programs that you see, uh, so that we can do that in our workouts there, so that we can start to teach kids how to do this stuff at home. Uh, but it's a pretty unique opportunity to have this in the Center, and it's a, a pretty unique opportunity to have someone like Mike who understands that we're not used to this, that our parents aren't used to this. So um, the, the generous offer of, of doing it gratis to start out is going to let us all uh, stick our toes in the water. And, and it is going to be for us to drive our parents and our, our players to, to start thinking like this. Um, getting everybody together as a team before practice or after practice you guys know what, uh, what a team is like, uh, like a family. So we'll, commu we'll communicate more with the organization, through the coaches, and through team managers about what the off what the brass tax of the offer is. But, but but there will be a you know a month or so free component to, to try this out and then uh, a, a very small balance uh, if people want to continue to take advantage of the facility. I have sheets that kind of lay that out, and I'll leave them, I'll hand them out to that one. And then uh, there's, uh, there's some other, I don't want to take up time for it out because you need but there are sheets here with just like name, contact, you fill those up, you can tell them I can get them, um, and then we can contact you directly. You know, once you know, like, hey, I have ice time on Tuesday, it's at five, and I really wanted a couple four. You know, like, I'm, we're happy to kind of work with individual coaches, but we know we're not working with just the organization now, so we've got to build a relationship with so we'll leave sign up sheets, you can fill them up, you can come and I'll get them back, and then we'll pass out these sheets and just sort of talk about what we do. Talk a little bit about what we have to offer in September. There's about 20 slots available for the month of September at our other facility. First come, first serve if you want to grab an hour. It's basically the goal is to drive it to around five bucks a can. Um, October, again, the gratis offer. It's kind of with the caveat that you're going to continue. Check it out for October, tell me how you like it, and we'll go from there. So we'll leave these sheets here for you. Um, and then you know, there's an email on there, our website's on there, it's easy to contact us. Again, we can get you contact sheets. We can reach out to you if you want to get contacted. Hopefully, uh, a few coaches will take advantage and those come ambassadors for the program. So, hopefully, you'd like to see them develop some more plays for our area. Any questions for us? That was easy. Awesome. Thank you, guys.
Something like that. I'm just really putting this fast out. I got three more sets I got to put together for sports. If anyone has any issues with the ability to put broken straps or anything, just let me know. Uh, we kind of went through it at the end of last season. So there might be some issues with some of the equipment. Just again, bring it to me or Dave Cooper. Dave Cooper's our equipment manager. Uh, water bottles, carriers, first aid kits. Um, Dave Cooper couldn't make it tonight, but he will have those. He'll put out a date. You guys can pick all that stuff up if you need it. Um, anything outside of that, just let Dave what you for. Uh, let him know what you need. Uh, he's got pucks, he's got uh, puck bags that I'll be passing out to. Uh, Corey Forms, if you have not coached with us before, I need a Corey Form tonight. I'll be submitting all those tomorrow. And I'll put together a list of coaches that I need. Submit those before the start of the season, but you have to have those in before the start of the season, before you step on the ice. Um, uh, we run our own tournament every year, Lakers tournament. So Jeff Pinarelli, um, all this is in my notes, so I, I had sent this out. So if you didn't get it, let me know. Uh, his contact information is on here. So what he does is. Uh, he has organizations come to him that want to play in the tournament. That's how he builds what divisions he has. So whatever divisions he puts together, he'll pull in our teams from that division. So if you do not want to play in the Lakers tournament, you have to let him know by November 1st. Again, his email is on here. Uh, this is just for the travel team, doesn't include the AAA. Um, Playdowns, state tournament, those have to be in soon. I don't know if they're in. Here. Yeah. Do you have that date? The play downs. You know what? The district meeting is tomorrow night. Okay. So I'll meet with him. I'll meet with uh, DJ tomorrow. He hasn't really given us anything yet. But, well, it was uh, October first last year or something. It's it was October first for it was October first and November first. Okay. October first I think was for phantoms and midgets, right? Yes. And then November 1st was for yeah, sport, sports and peewees, I think. Yeah, move those dates up, so. Yeah. It's probably September 5th. Yeah. But. Well, the 1st. But well, I'll, I don't know if anyone's uh, interested in play downs, yeah. or if you want an explanation yeah. of what it is. Anyone, everyone know what play downs is? Is it, if anybody who's done it could speak to whether it's, it's a good experience, is it worth it, is it? Um, yeah. When I first got it, we had two teams at each level. So it wasn't worth going to because you get smoke. Right now, with the organization the size it is, we had actually one team last year was, was our first winner of the state tournament. Whose team was that? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it's worth that. So right now, the way our teams are, you guys can compete, definitely compete in play downs. When you go to states, it's a much better competition. It's a good experience to the kids too. I brought them over getting smoked, and they still had a blast. The play down? Uh, the tournament, yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know if you, if you want to talk about how you want that in. I'll just, I'll just finish up in there. So, um, rosters have to be submitted to the league. You got to make sure coaches go on there, make sure all your players are listed. If they're not listed, let me know. Assistant coaches, let me know if, they, if they're not on there either. Um, if they're not on the, on the rosters, technically they're not supposed to be on the bench. I've never been asked at Westboro. So where it does come in place, if you do state tournaments, play downs, they, they will kick you off the bench. If, if you're not on the roster or if you're not board certified, one year I went to the States and I was going to coach with the teams. The other guys didn't do their stuff. Um, so um, part of the the Lakers before we merged, they had a program in place. They had a goalie coach on every team. They had a designated coach as the goalie coach. So when, when the uh, coaches are running all the players through drills. The, the goalie coaches would pull the goalies aside around through goalie specific drills. I'd like to get back to that. Um, if every every team could assign one of your coaches to work with the goalies, um, you're welcome to come out to all the goalie clinics. Um, 
Um, so right now, I'm talking to the uh, the guy that's running our building clinics, it's uh, Buck Stoppers. So he will incorporate our, our coaches that go there into the drills. Um, he's supposed to be passing out drills that he's running for that building clinic so he can bring those back to practice. And like we said earlier, repetition, just keep, keep the kids going. Um, USA Hockey requires work requirements. I will create a document and then kind of spell out what everybody needs to do. Um, you guys can do this on your own if you go onto the USA Hockey website. It's a way you can look up your own CP and uh, see what you guys need to do. I'm not going to be perfect on that, so please check your own. I, I got to put right now, I think we're up to 61 coaches, so I'm looking up 61 coaches individually on that, so I will make mistakes. Ultimately, it's up to you guys to get that done. Um, coaches jackets, Dave Cooper's working on that too. If you need a jacket, just let Dave know. Um, discipline issues on your team. Minor discipline issues, you can you can punish the kids by saving them a shift, period. Um, you can sit during practices, anything major, I would like to be brought to the board. We have a discipline committee set up. So anything that happens uh, outside of minor minor issues, I uh, just like to get documented in case in case there's further issues we gotta establish uh, a history there. Um, Westboro coaches meeting. This is mandatory. We have they have one set up August 29th. It's a Tuesday, 6:15. They have one set up for Thursday, September 7th at 6.15. You gotta make either or. Last year, I don't think we had any, any coaches attend, but I did go over some of the rules and I passed them out. Um, the other leagues, the Premier Hockey League and the Eastern Minor Hockey League, we will follow up. I know they'll have uh, coaches meetings too. Those are mandatory for the PHL. I haven't heard anything from the Eastern um, there's dates on here for conflict submissions for Westboro. I think the uh, PHL has already had their submitted. Um, Westboro, they'll have Barry rounds. So each round you can submit uh, conflicts for that, that set of dates. Um, start, start dates for the season for the Westboro League is September 9th. And then September 10th for the, the lower cross ice teams. Uh, that's all I got. You guys got any questions? <coughs> all you want to talk about tournaments? Okay. Just tournaments. If anybody signs up for a tournament, you can pay for it yourself. This excludes the Triple A teams. Paul, can you just say it? Any coach that signs up for a tournament, uh, excluding Triple A teams. Uh, obviously you can sign up and pay for it up front yourself or however you want to do it, round up your families to pay for it. But the Crusaders do, do offer, um, you can ask me, I'll look, cut your check. I won't mail it out to the, the, um, the tournament for you, but I'll get the check to you so then you know that you sent the check with the, um, with the application. So the t Crusaders, you can pay for it up front for you. Um, and then you just pay it back to, to the organization. What I do ask is you send me <coughs> one check uh, for, for paying that tournament. So collect the money back yourselves from your parents and then give me one check back because there will also be a cluster to try to piece everything together or get checks from like 100 different families for what I might think is a tuition. So I would appreciate you getting, getting one check, one payment back. Um, Something I haven't approved but through anybody yet, but if I don't get payment back, I'll apply that fee to your son's tuition. <laughs> a son or daughter's tuition, I guess, <laughs> would be the only way I could get it back from you or somehow. So, um, and any questions on tournament payments or loans? Thanks. I uh, think Cooper did ask me to just read a few bullet points uh, for him, and obviously. Uh, contact him directly. Um, I did put up the, the new jerseys on the wall. You want to see them next to the new logos? Uh, those 
aren't the finals and they're pretty close to the finals if you want to watch a jersey brand look like. Uh, these were reduced costs of $100 per pair versus $120 last season. Uh, coaches interested in purchasing them would be a cost of $40 if you want to get one. So uh, this preseason, we ordered uh, 225 new jerseys. Uh, 225 new sets of jerseys. The next uh, deadline to order was on September 1st. The jerseys were designed so that they would fit with the old jerseys, so the people don't have to buy new jerseys. Uh, and they could probably get some pressure, or parents will get pressure from the kids when they see these jerseys. That they'll <coughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>